I'll introduce you if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Andrew, what time is it for you in LA? It is 8 a.m. 8 a.m. So it's not too brutal. A civilized, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> And Kalpana, what about you in Dhaka? How, what time? It is 9 p.m., 9.03. 9 p.m. So it's late. For you, it's late. Oh, it yeah. All right. We well, are live you. now. It's exciting to be live from so many different locations. Yeah. I wonder where the audience is from. Are they all from the UK? Who knows? We'll, you will let us know. Send us messages to let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So Lucy, do you want to start? Well, I'm waiting for Charlie to tell me I can. Oh, there is someone from Portugal, someone from Italy, Manuela, Mafalda. Good. Ah. Happy. I'm in Italy too. So we have Dhaka, <laughs> Italy, Oxford. <laughs> half Bulgarian, Ukrainian, half Bulgarian. LA, Bulgaria. This is great. Okay, we're, we're officially allowed to start. Welcome, everybody. Zimbabwe. Thank you. Olivia, we're starting now. Good. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lucy Siegel. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists in a second. Um, thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world and whatever brings you here. Well, we know what brings you here. It is the, the third report um, from the circle um, led by uh, Jessica Simon, who I will introduce you to in a second. And um, this is a really, really important moment, I think. Um, this report is a proposal, a fully worked up uh, proposal to the EU Commission on living wage. And I'm sure lots of you are joining us from all over the place. We've been following this saga for a long time. And I call it that because um, uh, many people have done a lot of obfuscation and they've done everything they can to avoid implementing a living wage. So this is, this is a group of, of kick-ass female lawyers who are holding feet to the fire and making sure this happens in collaboration with um, garment workers, women working in the garment industry, um, uh, thousands of miles away. And um, it all started in 2017, I think, when uh, evidence was taken from lawyers in uh, textile producing countries um, on living wage. And the team basically couldn't find anybody paying a living wage at that point. So that's what brings us here today. Um, I am going to introduce you to uh, a fantastic panel. And please, could you send us your questions? Don't be shy, don't hold back because they're literally just here for the next 55 minutes now because I've just taken up five minutes. Okay, I'll speed up. Um, but uh, we will try and answer some questions after if we don't get through them all, but please just keep them coming. Anything that you want to know, now is the time to ask. I'm gonna introduce you to the panel all together and then we're gonna, um, I'm gonna hand over to Livia, who's gonna um, tell you about the Fashionscapes film that we are um, launching today as well. So um, I've just mentioned Livia. Livia Firth, Dynamo, give us a wave. Wave, thank you. <laughs> Many of you will know Livia. I have been so lucky to have been working on this for many, many years, over a decade, well over a decade. Um, and living wage was the thing that she introduced me to earlier on, early on. Um, and when we went to Bangladesh and we met garment workers for the first time many years ago, and we've stayed in contact with many people. Um, and one of the people that we stay in contact with and who is so generous with her time is Kalpona Actor. Give us a wave, Kalpona. From Bangladesh, <laughs> it's gone 9 p.m. She's always, always uh, turns out for these things and she um, brings such um, an important dimension. Kalpona, if you haven't met Kalpona, her story is just incredible. And she uh, started working in the garment industry in Bangladesh at the age of 12 um, and now is a leader for living wage and garment workers' rights. And we will hear more from her in a minute. I mentioned Jessica Simor. There she is, Jessica Simor QC, who has led this incredible work 
on living wage. And this is the third report that she has produced um, for The Circle, the NGO um, that is headed up by Raki Shah. Give us a wave. Who is there? Did you like that seamless transition? <laughs> we'll hear from Raki in a minute as well. <laughs> um, and none of us would be here if it wasn't for Andrew Morgan in LA, who has made this incredible uh, fashion scapes, which you're gonna hear about um, very shortly. Um, and Andrew and Livia and I worked on The True Cost, which many, many of you will have seen, which was um, a feature length documentary um, in the wake of the Rana Plaza catastrophe. And of course, last week was the eighth anniversary of the Rana Plaza catastrophe. So we meet as always in the shadow of um, the worst industrial accident, which I will put in inverted commas because we all knew the pressures on the supply chain and surely we all knew what was gonna happen if we carried on pushing this system to the limits and putting the pressure on the most vulnerable workers in the system, which has continued to happen. We are saying it cannot go on any longer. Poverty wages have to stop and this is the point at which it stops. I'm going to hand you over to, um, uh, well, our leader, frankly, Livia Firth. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so nice to have you all on Facebook, on here, on present, register for the webinar. And um, thank you, Lucy, for introducing everyone. I want to give you a little bit of a personal journey into where we are at today, because Lucy and I went to Bangladesh, indeed, for the first time together in 2008. And it actually was the first ever trip that we did with the Circle NGO. So the Circle was founded in 2008 by Annie Lennox and other amazing women, including Raki, who is now our CEO. And, um, and so Lucy and I embarked on this trip and um, little I knew personally that that trip would have transformed my professional and personal life forever. It was the first time that we got smuggled into a factory. And what I witnessed that day transformed everything for me because you know, I met women, garment workers who were making our clothes. They were in, you know, working 12, 14 hours a day, earning at the time $56 a month, um, working in, in factories crammed by, you know, they were producing on production lines like 120 pieces an hour um, at the time. Today, they'd have to do more. The factories had bars at the windows, they, you know, an armed guard at the front door. They had two toilet bricks a day. It was like hell. And so when I came back to London, I thought, this is not possible. Is this how we are, these are the women that are making our clothes. And so, you know, we, we, I started this journey professionally to campaign about, you know, the human rights side of sustainability and fashion because it's very very um, easy to address the environmental side and to disregard the human side um, then as, as um, Lucy said we you know then Rana Plaza happened 2013 Andrew Morgan saw that picture on the New York Times uh, front page of the New York Times and couldn't believe that you know, that thing happened in the name of fashion and, and wrote to me and Lucy and said, I'm coming to London. I hear you two are, you know, do a sustainable fashion. Can I come and talk to you? And that's how we started the True Cost all together. Andrew traveled two, three years, every country, met many garment workers everywhere. Um, in 2015, I went back to Bangladesh to see what had happened, if anything, after the Rana Plaza collapse. And I met a lot of garment workers. I met one of Kalpona's colleague, Nasma Akar, who told me something that resonated with me. She said, Livia, nothing will ever change until there is a transitional agreement on wages. Because until that day, brands will keep hopping from one country to the other in pursuit of the cheapest production line. So I came back, I told this to Lucy, Lucy and I called the lawyers in the circle and said, we need to talk because a government worker told us something that might interest you. And so we posed the challenge to the lawyers and Jessica, um, you know, who doesn't like challenges at all <laughs> in her career, she was like, okay, we really transnational agreement on wages? Why, why, why? Well, tell me more. And that's how we started for a few years to work and the lawyers led by Jessica, you know, 
first established the legality of a living wages universal human rights for the first time in history, then started to address all the other sectors and see what was happening across other sectors. And then last week proposed this legislation to the EU, which is a groundbreaking and historical moment. And I want you all to, um, to appreciate that something like this never happened before. And it really is up to a kick-ass lawyers women in the circle that this happened. So when we needed to tell this story, we thought, oh my God, if we keep writing reports and articles, it's not gonna be the same as if we're gonna tell a visual story. So we call Andrew, who, you know, after the true cost knows this the plight of garment workers better than any other cinematographer in the world. And we said, should we make a movie? And we said, yeah, but um, it's COVID, we can't travel, how do we do it? And Andrew said, don't worry, I had it sorted. So he set up crews all over the world and he put a crew with me in my house in London, a crew with Jessica in a studio, a crew with Kalpa in Dhaka, crews in, in, Viet, in uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. And, and just with local crews made this fashionscape episode. It's 12 minutes that explains incredibly well what it just took 10 hours to, to tell you the story. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Kalpona and Jessica. But more than anything, this is the story of people who never stop fighting, never stop fighting. And at some point, people who fight always meet, meet up with each other. And then the fight becomes bigger and stronger and unstoppable. And this is what makes me so excited and you know, happy about this moment in history that we are at. So thank you. I thought that was an incredible introduction to the um, to the issues and the background to both the report and the film. Thank you, Livia. Um, and lots of detail that I'd forgotten. And I think that's the one thing we've all now been working in on this and around this for so long that this point with the report Fashion Focus, a proposal for new EU legislation on a living wage. And Jessica will explain that out in a little bit more detail in a minute plus the fashionscapes draws together pretty much all of this work. And that's why I'm so excited because as I said before, how long are we planning to go on accepting poverty wages in this system? And I think the answer is, well, we're not, we're calling time on it. So um, uh, before, um, before we speak about the report and how it came about and what's in the report, we really wanted to begin by hearing about um, uh, what is happening um, on the ground in Bangladesh, obviously one of the biggest ready-made garments um, countries in the world. And that's actually where the report starts as well. So um, I mentioned Kalpona before. Kalpona actor, former child worker, now the executive director for the Bangladesh Centre for Worker Solidarity and the Bangladesh Garment and Industrial Workers Federation always makes time to talk for us, to, to us and here she is. Over to you Kalpona, if you could give us a sense of really what you've been through over the last 12 months and what COVID has um, brought to the garment workers. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Lucy. It is really, really, uh, you know, amazing to be part of these, uh, these folks. I mean, I know the, the amazing uh, fight you are doing with this proposal. Uh, it is absolutely true that without a law, it would be impossible to get a list for workers. Um, so um, how we have been in last 12 months? You know, I wanted to start with that, you know, COVID, this pandemic is really, really very practical for all of us in the, around the world. You know that we are suffering, uh, our uh, friends, families uh, elsewhere are suffering. But when we talk about workers, the situation really, really difficult, really dire. Um, soon the pandemic started, the business started showing their irresponsibility ever. They didn't take responsibility, rather saying that we have your back. What business did, the brand and retailers just started canceling the orders or postponing them and absolutely denying to pay the bill. 
and manufacturers, they got excused to say that, you know, if there is no money from the brands uh, that we owe to them, then we will be not able to pay your salary. It is not a severance that we are talking about or it didn't benefit. It is the legal wages they even wanted to deny to pay. And for workers, no wage means, uh, I mean, no jobs means no money, no money means no food. The life is that practical for our workers in here because they are so hand to mouth wages. The workers are not able to save any single coin for them that they can use during any emergency. So those workers started getting fired in the name of that there is no order. So the, uh, the manufacturers can keep continue keeping them in their uh, factory and pay them. But in the same time, the manufacturers started you know, doing the outcry with the government to get a stimulation package to pay to the workers wages and our question was then, you know, this is a three decade old industry. You made profit. What do you have done with money? How you cannot even pay workers for three months, let alone three months, even for three weeks. They didn't. So then government had to give a stimulation package with a, who was a, a, you know, a low interest loan. But unluckily the workers, those were working smaller factory, they didn't get access to that fund because their factory owners didn't meet with all the conditions. So those workers for months, they didn't get wages, they starved. And finally, they had to go back to home with the empty hand. And when I say home, it is the countryside where they, their dream started. They came to the city with a dream that these jobs will make their life different. But, you know, these this pandemic, during this pandemic, these workers just went to the town they started from. So, and when we're talking about workers, I meant to say that these are young female workers who just started know that what is the economic freedom is. So throughout last 12 months, over 300,000 workers lost their jobs only from garment industry. Again, around 70% of them young women who lost their jobs. So these women doesn't have any buy purchasing power now and they don't have a voice in their family, which they have achieved, but now they lost it. And now at this moment, uh, we are really in a difficult situation because the COVID uh, second wave hit at us. So country kind of lockdown situation, but factories are opening by saying that workers will be not get infected. We really don't know that what is the method they uh, you know, use to say that, but the factories are working. We are the uh, you know, people, like our organization, we need to keep open as, a, as our workers are wor you know, working. We cannot stop or lock ourselves being in home and sitting down not helping workers. But other people in the, in the country, uh, they are sitting their home or working from home, getting their wages, but for our workers, no. And we saw in the newspaper, the manufacturers, again, they say that they don't have enough money because they had a shortage of orders and they are asking governments to pay another stimulation package to them so that they can continue uh, the money. They continue pay to the workers' wages. But the gap I see that the business is supposed to take responsibility. Business is supposed to set up a unemployment insurance for workers. The, the government should have a social security program for the citizen as well as for workers. But none of have them thought of about these workers who made profit for them for years. When our workers need them, everyone just clean their hand and just run away. And we had to launch a campaign in nationally and global platform to naming and shaming these brands uh, and say that pay your workers. I mean, how, how irresponsible this business can be. So what we learned through this that the business need to be really, really right. The government need to get a educate law and enforce them around uh, a social uh, safety net and as well as unemployment insurance that can make you know our workers 
at least uh, give a security that they have money to buy food. And for long run, we definitely need a uh, living wage. Otherwise, the situation, the difficult situation will come, but our workers will be not able to fight with that. I wanted to stop here and I'll be happy to answer any question you have. Thank you. Kalpona, thank you so much. I've just got a really quick question for you. A lot of people would have been thinking about Rana Plaza last week. Did anything change after Rana Plaza from your point of view? Did anything get better? Thank you so much, Lucy, uh, you know, bringing this. Uh, yeah. So since Rana Plaza happened, uh, uh, you know, or who don't know that a legally binding agreement has been signed between brands and uh, with unions, global and locally, which call a code on Bangladesh fire and building safety. It's a legally binding agreement and that has made a phenomenal change in the area of safety for workers. Like at least out of 4 million workers, just 2 million workers are in a, working in a safe factories now. But we are really in a fear that whether this uh, progress will be protected or not, as uh, this uh, agreement going to be expire in May 31st, and brands they're supposed to renew this and they're supposed to uh, you know sign in a new agreement which will be not only for Bangladesh for other production country as well. So those those country like especially in Pakistan, there was many uh, many accident has happened. In very recently, Morocco gets a, get an accident. Uh, so this industrial homicide can be pre prevented if brands, uh, you know, sign on this new agreement. So, I mean, through this panel, uh, uh, you know, through this program today, I also wanted to, uh, you know, uh, request the consumers or lawyers or whoever you are, please raise your voice and put pressure onto the brands to sign on this new agreement. Otherwise, we need to go back to, you know, in a 2013 situation and maybe we'll be experiencing another Rana Plaza. So we really don't want it to face that again. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's just, you know, we're talking about homicide and starvation in this supply chain. It's really incredible. Raki, I'm going to come to you now because Kalpona mentioned um, some of the gaps that were, you know, really stark during the COVID, um, the, during the global pandemic, which is obviously still very much ongoing in Bangladesh. Um, and um, you, you've had to try and, well, step in really to try and plug those gaps as well as this work. So I wondered if I could hand over to you and you could tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing through the circle. Yeah, so for, for those that don't know, The Circle is an organisation that was set up by singer, songwriter and activist Annie Lennox quite a few years ago um, to support, you know, world's um, most vulnerable women and girls. Um, it does that through funding grassroots projects, but also advocating for long term structural change. And those have to go hand in hand. They absolutely have to. And we do that by the collective power of bringing extraordinary women and male allies like there are on um, this call together and um, building you know extraordinary change and I think the, the living wage proposal is a, a perfect example of that collaboration and um, change and powerful partnerships that can be made. Um, what we did during the onset of COVID um, back in March, um, we were seeing and hearing so many stories from the likes of Calpona and Olivia and others about um, all the fast fashion brands pulling contracts, um, garment workers being left destitute, and we pivoted very quickly to launch an appeal. Um, we were funding grassroots organisations with um, emergency food parcels, hygiene packages, um, also supporting legal aid and unions to be able to fight those cases. So we were supporting projects in Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, and we'll continue to do that. That's a really key part for us, building those, those two pillars together. So if anyone want, watching wants to support, um, do visit the Circle website and join us in that people power. I also wanted to give a, a bit of a personal reflection as well. I was just thinking back to the last trip I did pre-lockdown and it was actually to Bangladesh and it was to the Rohingya camps in uh, Cox's Bazaar. And I wanted to, this, this might not um, seem like a reflection related to garment workers, but I was thinking back to how generous countries like Bangladesh 
are of taking in over a million refugees from bordering countries and yet Western countries like us or Western brands like us cannot even grace the dignity of a living wage to um, workers in some of the poorest countries. And if that doesn't make you angry, I don't know what can when they can take in such um, a huge vast amount of um, vulnerable people, we should be doing our all to support. So that was just a, a reflection from me that God, um, where have we got to? Thanks, Raki. Yeah, um, Rebecca Heffernan Clark says, yes, Raki. <laughs> I think a lot of people feel similarly. Um, right, we're gonna hear about the report now um, in a little bit more substantive detail. So um, Fashion Focus, a proposal for new EU legislation on a living wage. This is the, um, the third big report that Jessica has led on from the circle. Um, just very quickly, report one established that a living wage was a fundamental human right recognized since um, at least 1919. In report two, she closed in on precedents for regulation by the European Union beyond its borders. And now here is report three. Um, Jessica, over to you to explain a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And um, it's lovely to be here, all of us today. I should just start by saying very much the beginning of all this for me was the True Cost film, uh, which I was lucky enough to see um, with Livia at the premiere. And it was it's an extraordinary film. And if you haven't seen it, you absolutely must see it. And I've tried to get it into my children's schools. I think it should be obligatory for all teenagers, but not just for teenagers. Um, really, everyone needs to see it. Now, I read today that Europeans, on average, uh, consume 26 kilos of textiles a year and dispose of 11 kilos. Now, putting aside the environmental impact of that issue, that should mean a, a possibility of creating great wealth and prosperity for those who make our clothes. Um, and yet it has done the opposite. And what we have is what I would call sustainable poverty. Uh, and sustainable poverty is simply unacceptable. Um, and our proposal is intended to tackle this market failure, which is effectively a failure that derives from mobility of demand for labor. So companies who need labor can just jump around and find the cheapest labor. And they can treat labor as a commodity, as if labor were just uh, a product like water or uh, salt or, or, or timber. But of course, we all know that labor is actually um, an essential core part of human dignity and intended not to create prosperity elsewhere, but to enable individuals to improve their lives and improve the lives of their families. And I always say that the economy has no purpose of its own. Its purpose is to improve the well being of people. Uh, but we, see, we certainly have an economic failure here. We have a market failure. Um, and the core failure identified by Livia is that wages are not paid uh, at the level they need to be paid to sustain a basic decent life and to improve people's lives. And as Lucy said, that's been recognized now for more than a hundred years. This is nothing new. Um, and it derives from international human rights law, uh, human rights law that recognizes the inherent dignity of every human being. So the problem with mobility of demand for labor in this sector uh, and the high availability of labor creates a disincentive for garment producing countries to increase their statutory minimum wage. That's because if they increase their statutory minimum wage, there is a risk uh, that companies that uh, work in, in those countries or will use labor in those countries will simply move somewhere else. Um, so the object of the proposal is effectively to reverse that race to the bottom in terms of wages 
and create an incentive for garment producing, footwear producing countries to increase their statutory minimum wage uh, and induce factories as well to pay more to their workers. So creating a more level playing field for fashion companies and helping fashion companies too, to ensure that the women who make our clothes are sufficiently paid. Um, I'm going to just put up a summary of uh, our proposal and I hope that it's going to work. Um, has, has that, that probably hasn't worked actually. Hold on, let me. It hasn't worked yet. No, no I need no. to find the, I've got it on my screen. Now I need to find the share. It's on the top, isn't it, somewhere? I should have. Mine's on the bottom, the little green box. Here we are, got it. Right, it's all given me everything. Here we are. Has that now shared? Yeah. So. Um, you'll see there the proposal, I may need to shrink it a little bit. Uh, it's effectively, uh, and you'll find it in the report, which you can find on our website. The heart of the idea is that the Commission in the EU, possibly in conjunction with the ILO, uh, decides for each of these garment producing countries the level at which wages must not fall, that is the level at which wages effectively um, keep people in such a level of poverty uh, that they cannot be said to be the most uh, decent, they cannot be said to be a decent wage. Now, if a country's minimum wage falls below that level, then the result of that is that the country will be listed on an annex to the regulation. And if a country is listed on the annex to the regulation, then additional due diligence obligations will apply to companies that use labor in that country. That will also be the case if the country doesn't guarantee the right to freedom of association or collective bargaining, which is also an internationally recognized human right. There'll be a three year transition period so that states can actually raise their minimum wage to a sufficient level so that they're not on that annex. If then a company imports uh, goods from those countries, at the point of import, they will have to establish that the garments were made by workers who were paid a decent uh, living wage. And living wage in that context is defined differently, it's for the company itself to justify a living wage, but the crucial point is it must not fall below that wage risk point. And the reason we've got a difference there is because we don't want this to be a ceiling, this wage risk point, we want it to be a floor, and we want collective bargaining and companies themselves to actually establish properly what a wage is. The annex itself um, will be subject to, and I can probably take this down. Oh. Let me let me just try and undo this share. Perhaps I can't. Have I managed to undo the share? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done. So, um, so the idea is that this annex will be subject to annual review so that it will be possible for countries to get themselves off the annex. The idea being that if a company um, wants to avoid the additional more stringent due diligence obligations, it will seek to go to a country that's not on the annex. Um, so the consequence we hope is that the statutory minimum wage in countries will go up. Um, now, if, if the country is on the annex and the importer um, signs the declaration about the living wage, uh, and that is then found not to be correct or not reasonably to have been believed, there will be sanctions, uh, including penalties and potentially criminal sanctions, which will be managed by uh, authorities in each member state. Um, in addition, there are going to be other obligations that apply uh, in terms of declarations by the company selling on their websites, etc. And of course, we have to remember that this is all going to be in parallel 
to due diligence obligations that are likely to be adopted by the Commission in any event. So what we're not saying is if you use a country that's not on the annex, you won't be subject to due diligence obligations. That's not the case. All of these companies are going to be subject to due diligence obligations in some form or another. It's just that our proposal specifically targets the living wage um, and its objective is to push up statutory minimum wages and wages paid by factories because we hope that factories themselves will also um, want to pay their workers more in order to keep contracts. Uh, and that will be the way that they can keep contracts by absolutely making it clear, crystal clear to companies that they are paying their workers uh, a living wage. At the back of the report, which I'm not gonna put up on the screen because it's very tiny print, but at the back of the report, you will find the full draft regulation. There are certain boxes still to be filled, certain um, concepts that have not been fully defined. But the, the important thing for our purposes is there is now a piece of draft legislation for discussion. And we hope people are gonna take it forward, um, criticize it and promote it. And eventually we hope it will become um, legally binding. Thank you. Jessica, thank you so much. Thank you, um, not only just for your work, but also for talking us through it in this really precise way, because I know that you can sit with reports and you can read them and it doesn't go in. But when, when I hear you explain it, I get it. Um, in the chat box, you will find the link to the report if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and we're already getting some questions about it. Um, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and first of all, we're gonna hear from our last speaker, Andrew Morgan, who's joining us from LA, from LA. It's quite early in the morning, well, not for him because he's got loads of children and he gets up really early. But um, Andrew, as you've heard, has been our longstanding friend and ally. And, you know, he doesn't just make documentaries. He also makes really, really beautiful feature films and he's incredibly talented. And he's stayed with this subject and he keeps agitating and he's an advocate for um, for change. And um, yeah, he's been life changing for some of us, especially me and Livia. And I'm so pleased that he's here today to explain the companion fashionscapes, which goes along with this report. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, I'm, it's not an exaggeration to say I'm in awe of the people on this call. So um, I'll make this brief. But yeah, I mean, first of all, when Livia calls and says, we need to do something. It's like someone putting like the bat signal up in the sky, you know, like I just answer and I say yes and we go make something. <laughs> more. Um, it's not a complicated process. I, um, when we made the true cost, it was uh, irreversibly life-changing for me personally. Um, there's not a day I don't wake up thinking about it. Um, I've described it as, as just something you can't unsee some of what we witnessed and it, you know, I think there's a there's a level of fed upness in, in in my head and in my heart around these issues because I think for years I've, like so many of you, sat around and listened to people talk about these things in abstract forms. But these are human rights emergencies. These are human beings. This is flesh and blood. These are fellow beings on this planet. These are moms. These are dads. Um, we're talking about the normalization of grotesque cycles of poverty. And we're talking about unnecessary suffering at a scale that's difficult to even fathom. So I think when we, when we sat down to, to, to revisit this and for me kind of to, to reconnect with uh, journalists and fixers and people around the world who I'd worked with several years ago, it was kind of like for all the progress we've made and all the awareness that we've grown, which is profound and I'm in awe of the efforts to do that. There is this feeling like it's the time to act now. Like there is a level of uh, moral clarity to this issue that stands outside of political complexity or economic complexity or even legal complexity. Um, so for me, it was a joy. It was a thrill to be able to attach a piece of empathy and the form of storytelling to sort of like a lightning rod of action that's being pioneered by Jessica and her team. And I just think it's an exciting moment where I think the, the, the lines are gonna be drawn increasingly clear between action and inaction. And there's this sense sometimes that 
the future is inevitable, that the world is on autopilot. And what I'm reminded by every time I get to listen to people at Kalpana, every time we make these things, I'm just reminded that like we've only gotten to any form of human rights because of people standing up and demanding it, because of people locking arms and fighting for it, because people on the ground and people close to levers of power joined forces and they said enough. And that's what we have to do here. It represents some of the greatest unfinished human rights work of our time. And it's just fun to be a part of. How's that, Lizzie? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, you can have that. I should have mentioned as well, and Livia reminded me that True Cost was um, voted by Hollywood Reporter as one of the 10 best fashion documentaries of all time. So if you haven't seen it, what are you doing? You must, must watch it immediately. Um, yeah, that was, that was amazing, Andrew, that sort of clarity. And that point that you make about, you know, we're not on autopilot. It's not written that we, that this is, this is, just doom and gloom. It makes me think of the climate movement and Bill McKibben, who's another great uh, activism leader. He said recently, I heard him say when he was talking about divestment, moving trillions of dollars from fossil fuels into renewables and causing that massive, massive shift that we need so much towards decarbonizing society. He said, you know, when we come out and we fight for things and we stand with the people who we have most in common with, we often win. So if that is exactly it. With living wage, why haven't we just said we need, we, you know, we, we demand it. We absolutely demand it because the opposite, as we know, is poverty wages. Um, thank you so much. Let's dive into some questions. We've got some quite technical ones about the report. So Jessica, I'll come to you first. Um, Colleen Barry, um, thank you for your question, um, asks about... Um, uh, can you describe the legislative process? Is any EU legislator or nation sponsoring the legislation? And are there any promises, any commitments to get this up for a vote? And how long might it take? So very good question. Um, the current position in the EU is that they are going forward with a general due diligence piece of legislation. Um, and that is sort of in the pipeline, they've been consulting about it, and there should be a proposal coming out in June. Our plan is to feed into that via um, the Commission. The only available technical route to get legislation you know, proposed or whatever through it is actually something for Citizens Initiative. Um, they're not doing that. For that, you need a million signatures and it's a separate proposal. So our thinking is that through um, contacts in the commission, uh, lobbying, um, meetings, we hope that someone will pick up the idea um, and that at the end of the day, it will come out in some form or another. So we sort of jumped, we jumped ahead if you like. Um, I'm involved in another citizens initiative in this area but it's a much slower process. And we just thought, well, let's go ahead and write what we think the law should look like. And um, our objective is to get someone to, um, well, I'm, I mean, it, as I've always said, it, it will probably not come through in the same form, but the idea is to get someone to pick it up and pick some of the ideas up in it. And so far, I and mean, I've been waiting for someone to come back to me and say, this is hopeless. And so far, I haven't had any response which says this doesn't work because. So I'm feeling quite optimistic at the moment, as I was, as I was saying to Livia. Well, that's good. Um, it does remind me. So I've been doing some work around community energy and there was, um, I can't remember the exact name of the legislation, but some clean energy bill in, from the EU. And similarly, activists have written the legislation because it was so complex and it was so outside areas of expertise that they have uh, they, they, they've done a similar thing in presenting a proposal, many of which the points have been taken up. So I hope, I hope this is the way it goes. Um, just going into due diligence, we had a question about that from Annabelle. Will companies be required as part of their due diligence obligations to demonstrate how they have determined the living wage for the location in which the garments were produced if this is the case, are there requirements for this process, such as the involvement of trade unions and worker representatives? 
So another very good, very technical question. One of the um, things that I found when I first came to this subject was an enormous amount of discussion and work on the meaning and concepts of a living wage uh, and how you actually work it out. Uh, what we decided to do in this proposal ultimately was not to delve into that subject um, because there are many methodologies that exist. So what we have is we have in, in our annex, we have a title, you know, which says the commission shall set out this calculation. Um, so the commission will do it probably in conjunction with the ILO. In terms of individual companies, yes, the idea is that they will have their own methodology for establishing and showing uh, a living wage. There is one technical problem which is that people say, and I don't know whether this can be overcome, but they do say that you can't require companies to actually say specifically how much they pay their workers um, because of the problem of um, competition law. I'm actually not convinced that that's right, but it's an area where there's going to be some kind of battle. Okay, thank you. We know it's a very vexed question. I wonder if I could come to you, Kalpona, because Malfa Mafalda um, asks, how much would workers' wages need to increase to be a good living wage? And Mafalda's worked in DACA and she knows that prices are squeezed unfairly. What, what would constitute a good living wage, do you think? Okay, so in the current, um, you know, cost of living, if we're just considering this, then the living wage need to be at least four times than the minimum wage that we are receiving. So the minimum wage is $95 a month. So the living wage need to be close to 400 or over $400 uh, at least. And there need to be an assurance that the cost of living will be not go up. Okay, thank you. There's another um, part to this. Um, sorry, I've actually moved the question now. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and would it help if buyers accept to pay the fair price of the products? Would that help workers get a fair wage? I guess it would. Calpona. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, if, if the brands do, uh, you know, pay the fair price, of course, that will, you know, ensure again, then we need to fight locally with the manufacturers. We need to bring them in a legal framework that they also maintain that, I mean, if brands give a fair price, but the manufacturers are reluctant to pay the workers, then there will be no point, okay? So then we need to again work on the legal framework within the country to make sure that the, the money, the fair money that comes from the brand, it is going to the workers. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Livia and Andrew, I'd like to bring you into this next question. Um, it's about, so from Grace, how can we better engage with fashion brands in order to encourage their buy-in for the proposed living wage regulations and ultimately their compliance with the regulations. So um, Livia, where do you stand on engagements with fashion brands? Because, um, well, there's, in, as people will see from the fashionscapes, there's, a, there's, there's a, a very memorable and may I say quite famous clip at this point when you are repeatedly questioning one brand about their, um, uh, living wage plans and you notably don't get much answer at the time? Well, I think fast fashion brands will never be able to pay a living wage and will do everything in that position to greenwash, muddle the water, make it impossible. Uh, because if they were to pay a living wage, they couldn't produce so cheaply and, and sell so fast. So their entire business model will crumble. So this is why, you know, they, this is why this legislation is so important. And by the way, Jessica can speak more about this, but so much is happening at EU level 
on governance, you know, on due diligence and governance legislation right now, that in a year time, you know, brands will have to, will, will be legally binded to um, due diligence in their supply chain and living wage will be a part of this. So put what fast fashion on one side though, I think a lot of other fashion brands, it was very interesting because when we um, started the first report um, and working on this with Jessica, we put her and other lawyers, we had a lot of discussion, very, very confidential discussions with some fast, fa uh, not fast fashion, with fashion brands for the lawyers to understand the whole process of where, you know, even the fact that a brand doesn't actually hire a factory when it produces abroad, but just place an order. So how would legally be possible to hold them accountable and all of that? And a lot of the fashion brands um, spokesperson and people who helped us behind the scenes to arrive to this point in the legislation said, you know, even for us, it's so important to have it because when we go to a factory, like sometimes we share factories with other brands, it's so complicated. You know, a lot of brands spend years like just discussing, how do you calculate a living wage? And, and he said, so for us, it's, it's so important that we move from a situation where it's, how do you calculate it? What if you paid, et cetera, to, oh my God, there is a law now we have to pay. So some brand, are really welcoming of this legislation. And I think with them, the fashion scape in particular will be fundamental to push for that, to make them support it. And, and even the, the, the law, the work that Jessica and the lawyers are doing is fundamental. Okay, thank you, Livia. And Andrew, um, Livia is also moving into explaining how fashion scape can be used as a as a tool, where, what do you think the leverage could be um, with brands and is there any? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, we, I, I think it's important to recognize that these brands are, uh, you know, while multi-billion transnational corporations, they are fueled and powered by people. And I think there's a, there's a real turning point happening inside some of these companies where there's actual conflict. There's a, there's a new generation of people who are saying, uh, this is this is not this is not okay, and I think that that awareness, that uh, solidarity, that messaging that uh, so many people have been creating around the world for decades now, is showing up. I think it's showing up in boardrooms. I think it's showing up in big places. Um, I also just want to point out too that I think like one of one of the th when we think about this, like I saw someone mentioned like U.S. organizations like WRC, like. The, the staggering levels of growing inequality around the world, is this is not a wage issue in the fashion industry alone. This is not a Bangladesh issue. This is not a European issue. This is a primary issue in the world where we are devaluing labor decade on decade and, and increasingly valuing capital. And that is building uh, really a suicide machine. So I think like change is inevitable. What we're doing is like a very fragile, poorly constructed house of cards and it will come crashing down for a lot of reasons, ecological as well as human. And so the bigger question for, for brands and for, for the industry as a whole is like, what is going to come next? Because they, they know, they know they're playing on an expired clock. Like they know that this level of exploitation should have been far behind us by now in our history. So I just think for anyone watching uh, a film like Fashionscapes, my, my goal is to always say, first and foremost, you have far more in common with a worker in Bangladesh than you do with the folks who are running these companies. And their struggle is our struggle. And it is representative. It's, it's the most visible, inhumane, incredible extrapolation of what people working for a living are feeling all over the world. And I think just connecting that, constantly connecting that and zooming out from just one area is powerful. And it's powerful because again, those people go to work in some of these brands, those people, uh, they are not just, you know, robot companies. They have people working there. Um, and the last thing I'll just say real briefly is that Jessica points out when we first talked that a lot of companies, and whether this is true or not true, we will soon see very clearly, but a lot of companies and people leading companies, when you talk to them off the record, say, 
actually I'm I'm okay with system change. It's it's actually like it's the wild west right now. And if there are ways to put system changes in place that isn't just like one company at a time or one country at a time, if it's a broader, you know, we're coming at this like Jessica said as a as an issue that doesn't allow someone to just pivot to the the poorer country next door then I think they're, they, they can be in favor of that. So I would just say, let's not totally write them off as partners, but let's make sure we are framing the conversation and not allowing them to do so. Thank you. Delivering body blows to the status quo, as always. Brilliant. Um, well, I, I do, I do want to come back to, um, to some of those individual country questions because um, thank you, Kate, Kate Larson, who's a, um, uh, seen that I was struggling to remove stuff from the from the chat and put it in the Q&A box so thank you um so um Kate says great leadership and does ask um in quite a detailed way um Jessica um how we can work with other um USA organizations such as WRC which I think is the workers rights consortium is that right who have done so much on um well, on getting brands to pay up um, and perhaps Japan, Korea to, to propose similar legislation in the US and those countries given that only 20 to 30 percent of exports from the export countries, Bangladesh, Cambodia are to the EU. There's also the vexed question of the UK as well, which I know I've asked you about before. So um, do you have do you have any sort of um, specific response to that on working in other um, territories. Well, it's obviously um, obviously essential because it is undoubtedly a global problem. We've focused on the market we know, the biggest market we know, um, or at least I'm familiar with as an EU lawyer, uh, which is the 450 million people EU market. It seemed the obvious first place to start, but obviously the US is massive and um, similar kind of proposals might be applied obviously it's a very different legal system and we need to look at that but i'm i'm definitely open to um looking at you know wider application of these kind of rules i think because many of these companies are global companies in a way if you target a single large market like the eu it's likely to have effect globally or at least some effect globally and the key, the key point for us was to um, create a system which would get the factories to pay a proper living wage and get the countries uh, to guarantee a minimum wage that was no less than a, a living wage. That was the sort of key structural change that we were aiming at. So if we achieved that structural change, I think it would have a wider effect than just purely in relation to imports into the EU. Okay, thank you. Understood. Um, we are coming to the end of the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, if there are any further questions, and I know that um, the EcoAge team are in touch um, by email, and um, we'd be happy to take uh, further questions. Um, and of course, you have been sent the link to the Fashionscape film as well. Um, I'm gonna say thank you to all our panelists in a second, but we're gonna finish with a final question. And somebody asks, what can we do? Now we've attended, now we've got the, the report and we've got the movie, what can we do? Um, and I'm gonna ask um, uh, Livia just to, just to close the show and tell us what we should do next. But I wanna say massive thank you to Raki, to Andrew, to Jessica, to Calpona and to Livia, over to you. Thank you. I will close the show with the bank. No, I won't. Um, I, I, what can we do? With Raki and the Circle, we are putting together a campaign to help support not only the lawyers in lobbying the, US, the EU and Brussels um, to make this legislation go through, and working with Calpona on the ground and Clean Clothes campaign as well to understand which are the most urgent priorities, as Raki said at the very beginning. So Raki, actually, over to you to close the show. <laughs> Thank you. <Olivia. laughs> um, so look, I think the, the most immediate things is watch, share, share, share the film, share it with everybody you know, um, 
share all the social posts, um, read the report, share the report, three shares that you need to do. Um, we want to take this report and proposal to the next level. We want to make sure that we are influencing the right people so it goes through. Um, please consider if you can, and it is a tough time for everybody, if you or know anybody that can help continue to fund our um, projects at the grassroots, but also the advocacy work. Um, we're doing as much as we can, you know, free, but it does take time of um, people. So, um, if you know any wealthy people, let us know as well. Um, I'm not shy about that. <laughs> so um, get in touch with the circle. But So lots you can do to support in small or big ways. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All Bye. right. See you next Bye. time. Bye. Bye. Andrew, Bye. Jessica, Lucy, thank you for sharing beautifully. <laughs> oh, no. Anytime. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks for coming, for everyone. Bye. Bye.